of the Bunurong of the Kulin Nation. I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So now to our guest speaker. I'd like to formally welcome Professor Carl Jones to Beaumaris Secondary Thank you. College. Thanks very much for coming. For those students who are new to this school, we like to have guest speakers of industry experts come and talk to you guys. Um, it's a rewarding experience and we want you guys to get inspired to make a change yourselves. So Professor Jones is an MBE, is a Welsh, Welsh conservation biologist who's been employed by the Durrell Wild Conservation Trust since 1985. He's a founding member and is current scientific director of the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation. Additionally, he's a chief scientist at the Conservation Trust um, an honorary professor in ecology and conservation biology at the University of East Anglia. Very impressive. I was interested in wildlife when he was a kid, just like many of you, um, and he's made his life to become um, something very special where he, he basically helps save species from the brink of extinction. Um, often outspoken on the importance of knowing your species and using empathy and practical knowledge of our education, Professor Jones is best known for his work in recovering the Mauritius kestrel. So for those of you who don't know, Mauritius is an island like off the coast of Madagascar. And um, this kestrel bird, there was less than what, four in the wild? There were four, yes. Um, four in the wild and thanks to Professor Carl, they're now up to a population of over 400. Mauritius, I know, right? Thank you. Mauritius is well known for its bird extinctions. Um, the dodo bird was only found in Mauritius and since then there's been many birds that have gone extinct on the island. And I think you're, because of you, over nine species of bird have been, um, of birds have been saved from less than 12 of a population in the wild and now they're flourishing. So yeah, congratulations. Um, Carl's work has been highlighted in um, Douglas Adams and Mark Cowardine. Cowardine's uh, radio documentary um, and his prize, which is the, like the Nobel Peace Prize for conservation um, for his work. So, what you were a nominate, like you were a nominee in 2012 14, and he finally won it, which is like the highest award you can get in conservation. So, welcome, Carl. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. I was going to ask for my, for my first question, what is that bird? But we've already been told, have we? What is it? And why is it so famous? It's famous because it's extinct, it's disappeared. And I think that's very sad. And Mauritius, which is the island I work on, is famous for the dodo. And I think that's something that we shouldn't be proud of because there are lots of species that are going extinct and we should try and look after them. I think it's wonderful to have all these wonderful creatures on this planet and if we can do something to save them, of course we should do. So I'm going to talk about lessons from the dodo. What have we learnt since the dodo has disappeared? Anyway, when I was your age, I wanted my own zoo. I wanted a zoo with all the different animals in the world because I thought then that the way to save them would be to put them in cages and to breed them. That isn't really the ideal way, but I still work for a zoo and I like being around animals. How many of you here have pet animals? Good. Anyway, I have pet animals as well and this is one of them. <laughs> It's the largest flying bird in the world, it's the Andean condor. And I have a pair in my garden, and I breed them every year. And my skills, if you like, are captive breeding and reintroduction, learning how to breed very rare animals in cages and putting them back in the wild. And that's just one of the purposes of keeping captive animals. Of course, it's not ideal to have beautiful birds like this sitting in cages, they should be flying around. But it's a technique that we use to try and save some critically endangered species. You've heard that I work on the island of Mauritius, which is off the coast of Madagascar. 
And it's a small island. And a lot of people think about it as being an island paradise. And yes, it's a very beautiful island. But unfortunately, it's been very modified by human beings. And this is the first ever illustration of the island. And it was the first settlement. And I think it's very special. It was made in 1602. And we've actually got a picture here of a dodo. Can you see it up there? But it's showing people who are on the island and they're exploiting it, using it, cutting down trees, killing things, catching things. And that's what people thought wildlife was four years ago. They thought that we could just go and exploit it. Whereas actually, it's fine to eat fish and to eat animals, provided you look after them properly and we have enough there. And that's what conservation about is about, is looking after and nurturing the world we live in. But unfortunately, we haven't done this worldwide, and we all know that there's been a lot of destruction, and there continues to be a lot of destruction. And Mauritius, even though it's a very beautiful island, much of the forest has already disappeared. And I'll show you two maps. The one on the left, the black, shows you how much forest there was in 1773 and one on the right shows you roughly how much is left today of native forest hardly any and as a result of this many species have disappeared we all know of the dodo but we've also lost some other very very interesting creatures a giant tortoise, a fruit bat, a fruit pigeon, a giant skink, a big lizard, a flightless rail, and a large parrot. And what a shame that we've lost them. But here in Australia, you've also lost a lot of animals. Lots of things have gone. You've lost the thylacine, you've lost giant lizards, you've lost the paradise parrot. And we must try and ensure that the other wildlife we've got, that we're looking after it, and we must learn from these examples of species that have gone. However, even though we've lost lots of things from this earth, there are still lots of wonderful species left. And these are pictures of some of the species I work with. And although I'm most well known for my work with birds, I also work with bats and lizards and plants and I'll be talking a little bit about some of these species in my talk you saw a picture of me right at the very beginning with my condo this is a picture of me when I first went to Mauritius as a young man and when I was a young man I thought I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna save endangered species I really thought I could make a difference. And I think I've made a little bit of difference in my lifetime. But there's an important lesson that we can all pursue our dreams. And if we want to, we can achieve great things. And I believe that all species are savable. But we need people to go out there and champion them. And to do it. When I was that age, I thought I could save the world. <laughs> As you do when you're a young person. And although we can't individually save the world, we can do our bit. And I think that's very important. We've got to make sure that we, make sure that we do what we can to, to leave the world in as good a state as it was when we first came in, or even better. And you were told about the Mauritius kestrel. This was the bird I went out to Mauritius to help save. And when we started the project, there was only four individuals left. And a lot of people said we should leave the Mauritius kestrel become extinct. We can't bother to see, we can't save it. There's so few left. It's going to go extinct anyway. And I was sent out to Mauritius for two years to sh more or less shut down the project, to hand it over to the locals and to pull out international effort. 
And I thought, this is silly. I know I can save the Mauritius kestrel. And the way we did it was through captive breeding. I told you that when I was a young person, I kept animals in cages and I learned how to breed them. And that's what we did with the Mauritius kestrel. We took eggs from the very last pairs of kestrels in the wild and we put them in an incubator and hatched them. And because we took the eggs very early on, soon after they'd laid them, the wild birds went and laid a second lot of eggs, which they then reared. So we doubled the productivity, the number of young they would have in, an, in a year. Half of them were reared in captivity, and the other half fledged into the wild, flew into the wild. So we hatched these eggs in an incubator, and then we reared them. Isn't that beautiful? And over the years, we learned how to hatch these eggs, to feed the babies, make them grow. And then we kept those adults to start a breeding project. And we learned how to breed them in cages. And that's what we did. I'm only talking very briefly about what we did. But in a period of 10 years, we were able to rear and release 333 birds and put them out into the wild and then we were looking after them in the wild by giving them nest boxes and I've seen that here you've been making nest boxes for some of your birds making nest boxes and then looking after them in the wild and the population has grown from four to four hundred still isn't as many as we'd like but it's a lot better than losing them and it's taught us that we can actually save species when they've gone down to very tiny numbers. But on Mauritius, there were lots of rare species. And although the Mauritius kestrel was the rarest, there was also this one, the pink pigeon. And the pink pigeon had become very rare because of storms, tropical cyclones that used to hit the island, or still hit the island, and also because people had destroyed the forest. And this is a graph that shows you the population decline of the pink pigeon. And when we actually started working on this in the 1990s, we only had nine or ten birds left in the wild. But what we did was to try and breed them in cages like we did with the kestrels, and we were able to rear quite a large number of them. But the problem that we had was that you could put a male kestrel in with a female and they don't always breed. K Sorry, did I call them kestrel? Pink pigeon, you put the pigeons together and they didn't always breed. And the problem is, is they don't always like each other. <laughs> They're a bit like school children, really. You have your friends and you have people you don't like too much. It's the same with pink pigeons. And so when we put the first pink pigeons together, we couldn't get them to breed. So we had to swap them around until we got pairs that liked each other. And you can see here on the left, there's the male. And he's going up to that female and saying, oh, I like you. And he's going, oh, ah, oh, ah. But the female is ignoring him. <laughs> Happens, doesn't it? But anyway. With a lot of work, we were able to get pairs together and get them to breed. And we were successful over a number of years in breeding a large number of birds in captivity, over 600, and we've put them back in the wild, and we now have over 400. So we've gone from 9 or 10 to 400, and we're hoping to get them up to about 600 in the next few years. Well, these weren't the only two very rare birds. There was another one called the Echo Parakeet. And this was the world's rarest parrot. And we only had between 8 and 12 when we started. And we watched the wild nests and we discovered that they weren't rearing their young properly, that most of the young would die in the nest. There just wasn't enough food for them. And so we used to rescue the young to try and rear them. Now then, it's very difficult to rear a baby parrot. I don't know whether any of you have tried. And it's even harder when they're sick and haven't been looked after properly. 
So we got this, we got a vet. And the lady on the right is called a rancher. And she's not just an ordinary vet. She's what is called a parrot paediatrician. And a paediatrician is somebody who looks after babies. But she's a specialist in looking after baby parrots. And that's her career. And she came to Mauritius and helped us rear these parrots. And we'd rear them in brooders and incubators and get them to grow. And we were very successful at rearing them. Now then, a baby parrot is the most beautiful creature you've ever seen. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? <laughs> and that's what they looked like when we used to take them out of the nest. <laughs> uh, we used to rear them. Anyway, do you know that if you rear a parrot on its own, it goes a little bit mad because it doesn't have anyone to play with. And that, so what we have to do is to ensure that they grow up in groups in the same way that you go to school and that you have your friends to play with. You have to do the same with parrots. And so we rear them in groups. And when they grow up in groups, they then grow up to be normal and healthy. And then when we've got groups of parrots, we can then let them go in the wild and we can reintroduce them. And this is what we did with echo parakeets. And this is a group of parrots that have grown up together. So they're all friends, and some of them are related to each other. And they've been put into the wild. And when we let them go, we also look after them. We've got to make sure they flourish and they do well. So we teach them to come back and take food. And we provide them with food. But because there's lots of other birds in the forest, we found that they were pinching the food off the parrots. So we had to teach the parrots to come back and to get their own food out of a special little hopper, a little dish, with a lid on it. And we taught the parrots to lift up the lid and get the food. And of course the other birds didn't learn that. And so when we put food out, we could be sure that the parrots would get it. And we've done this over a number of years, and we released over a hundred parrots and we've been rearing tiny little babies, putting them out in the wild, and now flying free on Mauritius, the world's rarest parrot has grown in population to 750. So we've done quite well. Isn't that good? And you've got rare parrots here in, in Australia. You've got the orange-bellied parrot. And I've been here for the last few months, looking, the last few weeks, looking at the orange-bellied parrot because it may become extinct in the wild. But by taking some of the ideas that we've developed in Mauritius, you may be able to save the orange-bellied parrot and get the population to grow. So I think there's great hope for these very rare species. So you've heard about three species, all of which were heading for extinction, and now they've got good populations. And I showed you some graphs earlier on, and you all know how to read graphs, don't you? Well, there you are. That's what happened to the parrots. You can see they've all, not the parrots, the parrot, the pigeon, and the kestrel. The populations have all grown. And you know, I'm very proud of this, because although it's only three other species I've worked with, at least it shows that we can recover the populations. But you know, I showed this to my bosses a number of years ago, and they looked at the graphs and they shook their heads and they said, Carl, why did it take you so long? And I said, what? And they were a little bit annoyed because we spent all this time here, look, with hardly any birds and the population wasn't going up. And actually that's quite normal because when birds are very rare, there aren't, a number of, there aren't enough birds around to breed and it takes you a long time to learn how to recover them. So although we can recover species when they're exceedingly endangered, it takes a long while. We can't achieve these things overnight. So we mustn't be looking for quick fixes, but must really work hard over a long term to actually restore species. Okay, I've talked about three species of birds. 
But we've actually saved all these and a lot more that became really rare. And we've also restored lots of reptiles and plants as well. So it just goes to show that when you work really hard at something, you can actually restore them. And the work with one species helps with the next. You start developing the techniques and the skills to be able to do it. So we can all make a difference if we try. But of course, there's no point in just bringing back individual species. You must try and rebuild the whole system where they live, bringing back the plants and the other animals. And this work with these few species of birds has actually been driving the restoration of a whole system. And this is an island I've worked on called Round Island. And when we started, you could see it was devastated. Very little vegetation, all the soil was gone, and the few plants that were left were dying. And it was because there were rabbits and goats on the island, and they'd eaten all the plants, and all the soil had washed into the sea, and you can see the palm trees are dying, and we've just got a few tussock grasses left. So what do you do? Those rabbits and goats didn't belong there and they were destroying the island in the same way that rabbits and cats here in Australia have done lots of damage. So we had to get rid of them. And if you want to get rid of rabbits or goats off an island, you hire New Zealanders. <laughs> These are wild men. These are Kiwis that came over to help us get rid of rabbits and goats off the island, which they did. And there's also another picture of me. I like showing pictures of me when I was younger because <laughs> it reminds me that once I was quite fit and I used to do a lot of this work myself. Anyway, the New Zealanders got rid of our rabbits and goats for us and the island started to recover. But a lot of the plants had disappeared. The rabbits and goats had been there so long, there were no seeds left in the soil and a lot of the plants that, we, that grew up were weeds. And we said, well, we've got to try and do something about this. So we built a field station and we said, we're going to replant the island. And so with lots of young Mauritians and people from all over the world, including young Australians, we set up a nursery and started growing plants. And in 2001, which is the first year we did our major planting, we put out 1,500 plants, which wasn't a lot, but it's a start. And we were very, very, very excited. We were bringing back plants to the island. And you can see young Mauritians, people from all over the world, planting plants back on the island. And we had to, had to go out there by boat or helicopter and stay there for a month to do this work. So we put a lot of effort into it. <coughs> but do you know that one year later, all those plants were dead. So we put all that effort in and they'd all died. And it was because the island was too hot and too harsh and not enough water. So we started to collect water in these large tanks and then water our plants and we planted them out. And then seabirds came and dug them all up. And the people growing the plants said, oh, I, I know what to do, they said. What we have to do, our plants are very, very rare. Your seabirds are very common. We just get rid of the seabirds. And so we said, no, no, we can't do that. We want to have the plants and the seabirds. We're rebuilding a system. So we started gardening. We said, we want the plants back, but we're going to have to look after them. And so we planted the to plant in these little cages to save them from the seabirds, stop the seabirds digging them up. And we watered them regularly and looked after them. And the result was plants came back. And very quickly they started to grow in the gullies and in all the various parts of the island and the soil was also building up. So the island was beginning to come back to life with a little bit of help. And soon all the reptiles on the island started to increase. 
they weren't just doubling in population, but there were ten times as many as were before. And that's what it looked like after we got rid of the rabbits, before the rabbits in 1972, and after we got rid of the rabbits in 2015. And you can see the island is recovering. So that's great, isn't it? However, it's never ever as easy as you think it's going to be. <laughs> Some plants started to decline. And these are the small plants growing on the ground. And some of the grasses were disappearing, and we didn't know why. And they were becoming very, very rare. And this plant here doesn't look like much of a plant. It looks like something you stepped on. It grows on the ground. Do you know how many of those were left? One plant was left. And we had to propagate it, take seeds and cuttings, and grow it in a nursery. And now we've got lots of them. But the reason these plants were disappearing was because part of the island originally was kept open. And it was kept open by tortoises. And the tortoises were extinct. They disappeared. So how can we put tortoises back on the island to keep open areas where the grasses and some of these other plants can grow? And this is a, a sculpture of the tortoise that used to be there. Isn't it beautiful? And I said, OK, what we need to do then, since we can't resurrect this extinct tortoise, let's find another tortoise to fill the gap. So we did some experiments on a, a little island called Ile Zigret, and we put on this tortoise, which is from Aldabra. So it's another island in the Indian Ocean. And we said, we'll use this tortoise as a replacement. And we wanted to see what impact it had on the vegetation. And we found that they went around and they started eating the fallen seeds of the ebony, which is a beautiful native tree. Now this tree was dying out because the seeds weren't growing. And we found the tortoises started to eat the seeds. And then they'd pass through and they'd come out and they'd poo. Look, tortoise poo. But isn't it wonderful? It's full of seeds. And then a few weeks later, we'd see all these baby ebonies coming back up. And we thought, wow! Before we had tortoises on the island, these plants were dying out. So we did a map and we looked at where all the young plants were. Can you see all the, the blue dots? The blue dots are all baby ebony trees, and the black dots are the adult ebonies. And this was a tree where there was no regeneration. And the tortoises, because they were eating the seeds and they were passing through their body, the seeds were coming out the other end, and then they were growing. They needed a tortoise to help their germination. So this told us, yes, it works. Let's take these tortoises back onto Round Island, which is what we did. We took them across in a helicopter. Lots of fun taking tortoises in helicopters. And over the years... We have taken to the island over 600 tortoises. And they're eating all the weeds. They're creating grazed areas. And those very, very rare plants that went down to tiny numbers, and one went down to just one, they're beginning to come back. And so we've got what's called a mosaic of habitats. We've got trees and we've got open areas. So I've just given you a very brief talk telling you about some of the work. We started off with one species of bird. We moved on to lots of others. Then we started to think about how do we rebuild whole systems. And we've actually been rebuilding this island. And everybody thought Round Island was lost. There was nothing we could do about it. And now we're seeing it coming back to life. We've put back tortoises. And in years to come, we want to put back other species. I want to put back another type of tortoise. I want to find rails, flightless rails, from somewhere else to put back to replace the extinct one. And I want to bring back seabirds, including one seabird that you have here in Australia on Christmas Island called the Abbot's Booby. So I think this work shows 
that we can save very rare species, but we can also restore the environment. We can restore habitats. So think about Australia. Even though a lot has been lost, you can still save the rare species and start rebuilding some of these lost and damaged systems. So there's some very important lessons. Conservation does work. There's an even more important lesson, and that is that every single one of you here can make a difference. If you want to go out there and do something really positive and help change the world, we can do it. We can't do it alone, but working together we can. And working with species helps rebuild whole systems. And so I'm a great optimist. A lot of people talk about the problems in the world, climate change and everything else. However, there's a lot we can do. And I think that all these problems are solvable. We just have to go and do it. So never forget that. And remember to be optimistic and to think about what we can achieve together. Thank you very much. Is that right? Um, Professor Carl talks about optimism because that's one of our core values at our school. Um, we talk about optimism a lot and, and that is something that we all um, try and strive for in, in our everyday learnings. And it's funny you say um, you need to be optimistic because do you remember the bar graph with the three different, um, sorry, the, the chart with the three different species of birds going from super low numbers to significantly high? That didn't really start to happen for, what, 20 years, 10? Can, can you imagine the hard work and effort that you go to and you're sort of not really seeing results, but you've got faith and you're optimistic in it? So that, that's really fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. How many years were you doing the I'm still doing it. Um, I lived on Mauritius for 20 years. And I go back every year for three months. And what I did, you can't, we can't do this alone. I worked with young Mauritians, and they are now running the project. And when I got sort of a bit older, I stepped back a little bit, and I said, you run it now. And I go there every year for a few months to help them. And so I'm still involved. But I'm also involved in lots of other projects. And I spend a lot of my time giving lectures, going around and seeing other projects and seeing how we can work together better. And that's why I'm here in Australia looking at your orange-bellied parakeet or orange-bellied parrot that's found on the coast in the winter time and it's in Tasmania where it breeds. Yeah, over there. Um, Show yourself. He's hiding. I mean, you start? What age did you start? When I was younger than you, I started keeping animals. But I don't see it as a job, I see it as a way of life. So I never get up in the morning and think I'm going to work. I just love what I do. And I wanted to do it from when I was a very young lad, and I'm still doing it now. Joseph, thank you. How long did it take you to like restore the, um, the circle island? OK, Round Island, we're still doing it. And it's going to take hundreds of years. Uh, but we started. And you, you think of all the damage that human beings have done on the world. We've been damaging the world for centuries. So it's, there are no quick fixes. We're not going to do it overnight. But if we start now, it means that our children and our grandchildren can carry on that work. And, you know, perhaps in gen genetic engineering, one day we'll even bring back extinct species. And wouldn't that be wonderful? to restore the habitats and put back some of these missing forms. So yes, it's going to take a long time, but there's a lot that individuals can do as well to help building up uh, this work. And I guess we're starting to see that happen, like the year rates from last year when we did our wetlands unit. We looked at species profiles and we looked at what those species need to actually survive and flourish, and then we looked at the different plant species that we can grow around our wetland to encourage them. So we're actually doing like a mini... 
Absolutely, and that's exactly it. Ourselves. So we're not going to see results straight away, but we're working towards it. That's why every year we have a wetlands unit where we do a little bit at a time. So hopefully you guys will see some results by the time you, you finish here. Mia and then, and then yours and then we'll finish. What's your favourite animal? What's my favourite animal? I like them all actually. Um, I like birds of prey, I like parrots, and, uh, but I like all of them. It depends on what I'm working on. You know, biology is so interesting. When you actually start to look at, whatever you look at becomes fascinating. But I like intelligent animals because I think we've underrated just how intelligent some animals are. And certainly parrots are very intelligent. And many of the birds you see around here are intelligent. And the more you study them, the more interesting they become. So the answer is all animals, but I do like big birds of prey. <laughs> I've got a question. Can you please do some bird calls for those birds of prey? I, I, I know you'd be good at it. <laughs> Lisa, I'm doing this for you. Is there an Ethan? Well, the, uh, I'm not good at making bird calls, but the Mauritius kestrels, when they're in the nest, and uh, the female is calling the male back because she wants to be fed. She goes, eat up, eat up, eat up. Is that all right? <laughs> what about the Andean condor? Uh, the Andean condor doesn't have a syrinx, so it doesn't make noises as such, but it has mechanical noises, and they go, shh. Wow, as they been around the thermals. No, no, that's, they make, they, 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 they're coming out, that's air coming out of their body. Wow. And uh, yeah, they make these mechanical noises and they communicate each other, with each other by making shh. And what's interesting is that they, they, blow, um, they blow air out of their nostrils and sometimes they blow bubbles. <laughs> Mucus bubbles. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention it. And when you go close to them, they sort of cover you with snot. But anyway, <laughs> that's an idea condo for you. Right. They're not very charming. Your question, um, how did you get to I was terrible in school. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you that. No, that's good. They need to hear that. But I learned a lot in school. Um, but I wasn't a very good student. And when I actually left school, I carried on studying. So I'm carrying on studying to this day. And I... Yeah, I didn't get my, my PhD until I was 40. So uh, it's because when I was a young lad, I wasn't very good at school. But uh, yeah, I studied for many years after I left. But studying is fun. The problem was when I was in school, I didn't go to a beautiful school like this. I went to a very traditional Welsh school and I didn't enjoy it that much. And uh, so I didn't realize how exciting it was to learn about the world. And when I left school and I went to college, I realized just how exciting learning was. So I carried on learning up until today. You never finish learning. And learning is, is wonderful. So it's, a, it's a great pleasure. It's lovely to be here. This is, I think, perhaps the most special talk I've given. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.